Hello, everyone. <laughs> we always start all our events with a little illustration of the, uh, the disruptive nature of the world today. So thank you for participating in that little live action demo. My name's Sue Pritchard. I'm the director of the new RSA Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Just before we begin, please make sure your mobile phones are set to silent. We're filming this evening and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone who's watching. And a reminder that the hashtag for this evening is hashtag FFC Commission if you'd like to get involved in any discussion on Twitter. So, housekeeping notice is over. I'm really tempted to say, we're not expecting a fire alarm this evening, but <laughs> that moment has passed, hasn't it? Thank you all for coming to mark the launch of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, an ambitious two-year independent inquiry to engage citizens and communities, producers, businesses, experts in shaping the future of our food, farming and countryside systems as the UK negotiates its exit from the EU. The sheer number and variety of people in the room is perhaps a, a measure of the anticipation, excitement even, around this commission. You'll see I'm so excited I'm wearing our logo. <laughs> but in a sense, this illustrates, I think, the intent of the commission, bringing together people with a shared interest and a real commitment to addressing the critical questions that face us. For we live in interesting times, turbulent, disruptive times, and such extraordinary times require extraordinary leadership. On our panel today, we brought together people who have already demonstrated exceptional leadership, creating the conditions for different kinds of collaborative conversations bringing together people who may have different perspectives on food, on farming, and on the countryside, but who nevertheless recognize that we only solve intractable problems with cooperation, with creativity, and with commitment to a shared purpose. And the biggest prize, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to transform the way we eat, the way we farm, to regenerate our environment and our countryside communities. On our panel tonight, we have Helen Browning, Chief Executive of the Soil Association, Caroline Mason, who's Chief Executive of the ESME Fairburn Foundation, our very generous sponsors. We have Lord Curry of Kirkhall, Don Curry, and Sir Ian Cheshire, Chairman of Barclays UK, Devon PLC, and now, of course, Chairman of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. We'll be very keen to hear your comments towards the end of the evening, and there'll be time later for discussion. But before we hear from the panel, I would like to invite my colleague, RSA Chief Executive Matthew Taylor, to come to the platform and say a few words. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to be very, very brief. I just really wanted to uh, welcome um, this initiative. Um, we do have some form uh, in this area. If I say that 1758 marks our first foreign to agricultural issues, please understand I don't mean 10 minutes ago. Um, uh, that was the year we awarded a gold medal to the 5th Duke of Beaufort for planting 23 acres or planting 23 acres of oak trees. A hundred years later, an RSA Food of the People Commission encouraged the adoption of refrigeration for fresh produce and recommended that cooking be taught in schools. In 1998, Focus on Food was launched here, leading the way uh, in bringing it, drawing attention to healthy eating and how food is grown. I was really hoping to surprise you by telling you that that initiative was led by our then chair, Prue Leith, but sadly I tweeted it earlier. Um, <laughs> the RSA also has a history of influential uh, commissions throughout our time, most recently the City Growth Commission and the Inclusive Growth Commission. I think that's important because there's a strong economic dimension to this and also a strong dimension that is around uh, inclusion. I just finally want to say this, that we are really proud to be uh, hosting this commission, but one of the RS things the RSA thinks about all the time is how is it that change actually happens. And so our approach to this commission is that we hope 
In fact, I'm sure it will be a fantastic report and lots of other reports leading up to it. But we will, throughout the process, indeed we have already started to engage, to engage our fellows, to engage stakeholders, to engage uh, citizens uh, as a whole. And I hope throughout this process that we'll see further uh, engagement, we'll see new conversations, we'll hear new ideas, we'll even support practical innovations throughout the process so that at the end of this two-year process there is a huge amount that has already happened by the time uh, we finally report. So once again, I'm delighted the RSA is hosting this commission. I'm very grateful to our partners and uh, sponsor. I'm delighted that we persuaded you, Sir Ian, to uh, chair it, uh, and I'm sure we're going to get off to a great start this evening. Thank you. So, first of all, this evening, we're going to hear from Helen Browning, who is Chief Executive of the Soil Association, and she also chairs the Food Ethics Council. Helen is herself a farmer in Wiltshire and was awarded an OBE in 1998 for her contribution to organic farming. Helen was a driving force in the steering group that led to this commission. Helen. Thank you, Sue, and I'm just so delighted to see all these people in this room today and that today has actually come about. Um, it uh, feels like a huge milestone uh, for all of, uh, or all of those who have helped nurture uh, this process uh, to this moment of launch. I'm just here to, to speak on behalf of the steering group and to give a little bit of background as to how uh, the Commission came to be. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, in the, in the weeks and months after uh, the Brexit referendum, so many people were saying in so many places, what we need is another Curry Commission. Um, and as the weeks and months went on, um, you could see, uh, and you can still see, hives of activity everywhere. Um, but often that activity, particularly between farming and the environment, was portrayed as being somewhat in opposition, um, and certainly things weren't really joining up uh, into that collective vision that we all need and deserve now. And some issues, like uh, public health and the well-being of this and future generations, were not in the conversation at all. So one or two of us um, tried to prompt government to establish uh, a commission. Um, if I'm honest, there was little appetite uh, for that. And maybe, maybe that's just as well. Um, because I think that an independent commission under the auspices of, uh, of the RSA uh, may be able to reach the parts that governments find it hard to reach. Maybe it can get beyond some of the politics. So while we, the steering group, have hoped that this will be hugely helpful to the governments of the UK. We also hope that it will enable businesses, communities, farmers, individual citizens to get our acts together. Because some problems, it may be for us to fix, those people on the ground who are doing stuff in real life. Some of the opportunities, it's maybe for us to take, and I hope the Commission will prompt us and enable us and help us to get our act together, as well as to make recommendations in the policy arena. Anyway, uh, early this year, uh, a small group, a coalition of the willing, I think we called ourselves once or twice, but representing key stakeholders uh, across a whole range of, uh, of, of communities. So uh, I will name them because they've all been brilliant. Helen Ghosh from the National Trust, George Dunn from the Tenant Farmers Association, Andy Richardson from Volac, Sue Davies uh, from Witch, uh, Kath Delmeny, uh, convener of a Sustain, and Shirley Kramer, uh, chief exec of the Royal Society for Public Health. We came together, many others helped us. We had dinners, we had discussions all over the place, and we began to talk to funders, um, and uh, notably to, to Esme, Esme Fairburn. And Esme uh, indicated that if we were to find the right host organization, uh, they might be prepared to back this critically important process. And so here we are today. Now the steering group has now uh, stood down, uh, but our enthusiasm is undiminished. And this is actually not another curry, 
much as we love him and much, <laughs> much as we valued that process. Um, these are different times and different challenges and different opportunities. But the curry theme um, of reconnection is as relevant today uh, as it was in 2001, 2002, when we sat as that commission. And as well as joining things up, as well as finding a more collective vision, as well as knocking heads together, because I think there's going to be need to be some of that, and tackling the tough questions, because they need to be tackled, and the opportunity to put health and well-being at uh, the heart of our food, farming and countryside, as well as all of this, I think this commission promises to connect beyond the usual suspects, to, to really listen to what matters to people as citizens, as well as, as consumers. This is an extraordinary opportunity. So I really want to thank those people in this room, the steering group, many others who have helped to midwife it to this point. And above all, I want to thank Esme Fairburn, uh, who, like us, I think, have faith that if you have a great process, if you bring the right people around the table, then great things will come out. We may not know what they are today, we may not know where this will take us, but we know that if we have the right process and the right spirit, that great things will come of it. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And uh, that leads us very neatly into hearing from our funder, Caroline Mason, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Esme Fairbairn Foundation. Before joining Esme, Caroline was Chief Operating Officer at Big Society Capital and preceding that, the Charity Bank. Um, hello, it is um, an absolute pl pleasure and a privilege to be here tonight, actually both personally and professionally. Personally, because my dad, who's 94 this year, um, has always been completely passionate about food and sustainable food. In fact, when I went to university 35 years ago, he hand-typed a list of all the E-numbers <laughs> that existed <laughs> and what they were used for and uh, how bad or good or not good they were. Um, so I could be prepared for my um, university career. And he, in fact, he still, when he comes around, goes through all my cupboards and um, <laughs> takes out tins and reads them and says, do you know what you're feeding your children? Um, uh, so I, I come by this with a well. Um, but professionally, Esme um, has been funding work to influence the food system since 2008. Um, and since then, we have made 170 grants in this area with a total value of 17 2 million pounds to community and voluntary organizations all working towards change. And I want to thank my colleague Lawrence Scott, who's here. Where are you, Lawrence? Who um, has led on all this work at ESME and actually navigated uh, the funding for this commission um, through ESME. And um, please do talk to him afterwards if you want to know about all the work that we do. Um, we started because we recognised that the wider interests of people, communities and the environment were being very poorly served um, by the current system of uh, food production, processing, distribution and retailing. Um, but we had a sense that there was a potential for change um, and, um, and, an, and an appetite for change. Uh, so we did what I think foundations do best. Um, and that's, we set about finding and backing exemplar demonstration products, uh, products, projects, um, that showed what a better food and farming system might look like. But also that tried to engage with people, um, with the food they eat, and to influence the policy in, environment. Um, and there has been some extraordinary work that has been done over the last um, eight or so years. And these range from major proje uh, projects like, like the Sustainable Food Cities Initiative, um, and this has, inter has introduced um, integrated sustainable food strategies in over 50 cities and major towns across the UK. We started out with six, thinking we might get 12, and now it's, it's, it's escalated to 50. Um, and they work to improve um, food, in, uh, food in hospitals and foods and, um, and in local authority commissioning um, to community-supported agriculture schemes um, that directly engage local people in growing their own food. 
We have also supported the work of leading thinkers in this area too, from the City University's Food Research Co Collaboration, to the Food Foundation, to the Sustainable Food Trust, all of whom have contributed in different ways to this collective understanding um, of the shortcomings of the current system and, and the potential solutions. And Sustain has been involved very early on um, in drawing together thinking and action. But we also recognise the world for what it is, and um, we've also funded, for example, the Shift Foundation in its work with fast food retailers um, and the efforts of Fair Share um, and their commercial partners to start thinking about making good use of waste food. Um, and we know how important food is um, and how, how it features in the social and environmental determinants of inequality and poor health. And the farming community has been and continues to be the custodians of much of the land in this country and they take that responsibility very seriously and they recognize that the way things are now is not good and understand that the, sort of the toll that is being taken on our soil on our waterways our habitats and our wildlife um, and not only is this not good for all of us but actually it's not sustainable for those whose livelihoods depend on the land and they're trapped in a, in a, in a, in a system of, pol of policy and subsidy that until now seemed impossible to change. We know that many want to do the right thing, to once again be equipped and empowered, to be genuine and good cust custodians and stewards of the, of the countryside, but they need freedom, reward and encouragement to be part of reshaping the system. A guiding principle of ours is always that we must fund work that deeply involves those affected in designing their own future. And, and, and it's because of this, this is also, also a guiding principle for this commission, um, that we wanted to give it the support to succeed. We think that this RSA initiative is arguably the greatest opportunity that we have seen as a foundation that has a scale and ambition to catalyze change. It comes at a unique time when the current food and farming system becomes momentarily unfrozen. It's a piece of work that draws on really practical experience from those that were supported over, over the years, reflects on what they've learned and, and, and what they have to contribute. And that aims to reflect what people want from the future of their countryside and their food and farming system. We hope that it will also enable the presentation of thoughtful, representative and coherent set of policy options that will really influence what comes next. We're completely delighted that Sir Ian, with his background in influence, has agreed to chair the commission, and also that we have someone of Sue's calibre to lead the secretariat. They are ably supported by the commissioners, some of whom I know have been integral in making all of this happen um, over quite a long time, um, and it's because of those early conversations that we are all here today. They come from such a variety of backgrounds. They're well informed, um, and so it means that the scope and depth of this commission will be ambitious and challenging. I want to end back with my wonderful dad, actually, um, because as well as at the time being quite irritating um, with his technical e-numbers and education, he and my mother always, always also taught us that breaking bread with good food and family and friends is an essential part of being happy and healthy. As a society, our rites of passage are almost always celebrated with food and company. Food is fundamental to who we are and to the prosperous fabric of our society. And so, we at ESME wish the Commission every success and hope that the consensus that it builds for future generations is broad and deep. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. That was, that was lovely. I love that um, very warm ending there. Now we move across to... Lord Curry of Kirkall, Don Curry, who is a Northumbrian farmer and businessman, former chair of NFU Mutual, but Lord Curry is probably best known for his role in chairing the Policy Commission on the Future of Farming and Food following the foot and mouth outbreak in 2001 when farming was at a very critical time. Don. Sue, so, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great um, pleasure for me to be here. And I think it's a great omen that this commission started with a fire alarm. <laughs> I'm assuming the commission will light lots of fires in the course of its deliberations. So I think that's good. Um, as soon as the Brexit vote uh, was uh, announced, um, Helen and I had a conversation about the need for a commission. Um, and I was lobbied fairly strongly at that time, but 
one curry commission is quite enough. Thank you. Um, and can I first of all pay tribute to Helen? Because without Helen's tenacity and determination to make this succeed, we wouldn't be sitting here tonight. So Helen, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Can I also thank the RSA and the Esme Fairbairn Foundation and Ian, too, for taking this on. Um, this is really important, important because, and, and Helen will have forgotten this, Helen is uh, the transferable link between the Curry Commission and this new commission, so she's the common denominator between both. Helen will have forgotten this, but we had a debate around the table uh, 15 years ago about the vision, the length of the vision that we were operating towards. So is this a 20-year time scale? Is it a 30-year time scale? Is it a 10-year time scale? How long do we think this vision of ours uh, should be and the dead time towards which we were working? We kind of agreed on 15 years, believe it or not, and it's 15 years since we reported. <laughs> So isn't that a great coincidence that uh, the Brexit vote coincided with the 15-year vision we had for the Curry Commission? And so it is time, not just because of Brexit, because actually the Curry Commission now is out of time now uh, in that we've completed uh, the 15 years. Uh, the great advantage that this Commission has over the one I chairs is that you actually have a completely blank sheet of paper. We didn't have a blank sheet of paper. We were operating against the background of a common agricultural policy that was deemed to have failed during the 1990s for all sorts of reasons, which many of you will recall. We had food scare after food scare. We had barns that were full of food. So the policy was failing. And we were given our terms of reference by government, which did constrain us slightly. You are not in that constrained position. You can start with a clean sheet of paper and you can approach this from as broad a landscape as you wish. And I think that's hugely important because if this commission does nothing else than to span departments of government and come up with a set of recommendations and policies which encourage government to get joined up behind a policy, that would be fantastic. Um, and we were disappointed, Helen's right, that uh, DEFRA, our government, didn't commission this um, over a year ago. Uh, but, but if it had, it may have been more constraining than you are now. And I think uh, the, the issues uh, go way beyond the remit of DEFRA. Uh, the potential of the farming and food industry in the countryside to contribute to our health, uh, there are issues around education, around business and training, which need to be embraced within uh, this commission. So I think this is a great opportunity to do that and uh, to produce uh, a plan which will engage not just all the key stakeholders to help uh, deliver that, but different departments of government. So what worked what worked well, I've been asked this question numerous times about the, uh, the Curry Commission and I've just I've been asked to uh, deliver a lecture in Belfast in two weeks' time about, um, so, you know, what did we agree then, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and if I was drafting a report, what would I report? So what worked well was the consultation process. And this is absolutely critical in my view. Um, we got huge stakeholder buy-in when we launched the report because the stakeholders felt they'd had a part to play in designing the report itself. Every stakeholder group contributed to uh, the evidence gathering process that we set up and they could all see their fingerprint somewhere in the report. And I think that was a really important outcome for us. We met 55 different groups um, and uh, in some of those meetings, there were two or three organizations. So uh, the extent to which we were consulted, I felt, within the timescale, was very broad. Organizations came out of the woodwork that I'd never heard of. Um, it's just a fact of life. Suddenly, when you're available and gathering evidence, people want to contribute, and that's good. Um, 
So the process of consultation, I think, worked uh, very well indeed, and I would encourage the Commission to consult widely. Um, so I, my, my, um, my expectations are high. All of our expectations are high. And I think with the team we've got, we can anticipate a really worthwhile exercise. And I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you, John. And it's a, it's a very... Um powerful battle that you hand on to our next and final speaker, Sirian Cheshire, who will be known to most of you as chairman of Barclays UK and of Debenhams PLC. He also works with government departments across Whitehall as government lead non-executive, sits on the World Wildlife Fund's Council of Ambassadors and is a trustee of the Prince of Wales's Charitable Foundation. Sirian was knighted in 2014 for his services to business, sustainability and the environment, but most important of all, of course, he is our chair of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. Thank you very much, and uh, well done for persistence of getting here. Not, not just the fire alarm, but apparently the strand was blocked with... Uh, um, so this, um, we've, we've started as we mean to go on. We will get there in the end. <laughs> and uh, I love the fire starting comments. We shall definitely try and do our best on that. I just want to say a few words, um, not really about uh, the things that have already been covered at the backdrop, but maybe a bit more about how I see this um, developing from here, which is obviously sort of day one. Um, but I am um, very grateful to, to all, all the panellists here, and um, my sense of the no pressure has gone up significantly <laughs> since uh, this started. Um, but I just want to explain that one of the reasons I've taken this is that the phrase once-in-a-lifetime opportunity is incredibly hackneyed often. But this generally is. Whatever your views were on the rights and wrongs of Brexit, it has unlocked an extraordinary opportunity for us, uh, the UK, and the devolved nations, to think very hard about what type of systemic change we want to have in an area that has not been able to be really radically looked at since 1947. And we have to think, to Don's phrase, forward the same period from 73 you go forward you get to 2060 so we have an extraordinary genuine once in a lifetime opportunity and it's a joined up opportunity because we can think about not just the agricultural subsidies but the trade policy implications the citizenship health and education and don's completely right about this is not a defra project and i'm actually secretly quite glad that defra haven't taken it up because i think it allows us uh, to work across although i have to say my personal experience of working joined up across government uh, <coughs> is challenging, so that one will be something to look forward to. Um, but in terms of how we're going to approach this, um, I'm just going to come in a minute to do, I hope, a big reveal of who our commissioners are. Um, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I want to just explain a little bit about how we might... Can we put it... Can we reverse it? Thank you. <laughs> That's a double tease in the trade. Um, the reason I wanted to just say is how we're going to go about this and building very much on what Don has just said, and we've got a tremendous uh, example a mere 15 years ago. But I think the, 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 there are sort of few key themes we want to be very, very clear about. Firstly, this is very open and very consultative. We've got a very broad range of commissioners deliberately. This isn't a single person's agenda. This is an attempt to have a new conversation in a way that is much broader possibly than, than individual both departments or organizations can have. And I hope what we can do is provide a safe space in which people can perhaps have some pretty challenging conversations uh, and be honest, maybe in private, about some of the challenges they see that they or their organizations might uh, not be able to do in, in a more public or frankly a more government-led space. Um, I'm personally committed to making sure, as the sort of designated honest broker here, which is brackets for the ignorant one in the room who doesn't know anything about any individual subject. So I'm, I'm in a position of extreme strength on that. But I believe that what I can do is assemble a group and organize a process, and that's really my job, which will be genuinely open and uh, n not informed by things other than evidence or examples or things that we think we might be able to test and try. And we will be doing research as we go through this, which is going to be an incredibly important part of our commission's work. 
Um, I think the, 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 the two other key things I want to uh, sort of focus on is I think this idea of systemic change that uh, Matthew's talked about and others is vitally important and the issues are so interrelated. I found it fascinating seeing the, the stats in this um, excellent starter uh, document we have here, a prospectus. Um, but if, if food subsidies are currently 3.1 billion out of the 3.6 billion farm income, and yet we spend comfortably more than that in the water sector in a combination of pollution control and, uh, and drainage and flooding uh, prevention. And then the cost of the NHS of obesity is 16 billion. So if you go through these sorts of numbers and start saying, well, where are some of the connections? Where might we be able to do something different? And, and I genuinely think this is a chance for the UK to rethink in a joined up way and understand some of the systemic interactions and where we as citizens uh, want to go forward and to create the next, um, I think 50 years is probably our, our, our target, but slightly more action orientated in the short term. Um, so my, my view is this is a very collaborative co-creation process and one of the points of tonight is to invite everyone in. Please bring your ideas, please bring your you know, experience in particular and your ideas. And I think particularly we're trying to reach out uh, beyond Westminster, we will we'll get around the, the various uh, nations, but we're also going to reach into new areas. Uh, tech is a particularly interesting area, I think, for us to, to examine. Uh, I've obviously recently got more interested in it. Well, Barclays have a massive agricultural interest, so financing is, is part of the picture. I think there are lots of different communities and capabilities that we can tap into. So on, before I come into this and, and, and reveal who the commissioners are, I would just stress that we've gone for sort of a personal invite of people who we think will bring real um, uh, heft to this and have brought experience, um, but it's not purely a question of assembling a series of institutions. These are the people, so this is a personal combination. Uh, but I'm really um, now under even more pressure having assembled this bunch of commissioners because they're pretty uh, formidable lot. So if we could now get the slide up, I will talk you briefly through. Uh, no, we can't. Okay. Right. Uh, Helen, I'll go to the top. Helen Brown, you've obviously met. David Pension from uh, NHS England. Anne Jones, the Vice Chair of the WI. Uh, David Hill um, from the Environment Bank and obviously representing Esme Fairburn. Tim Jackson, um, Economics Professor um, on Sustainable Prosperity. Ophi Abraham from British Hospitality Association, key part of the food system. Uh, Kath Dalmeni, the CEO of Sustain UK. Fiona Reynolds, uh, now Emmanuel, former uh, Director General of the National Trust. Baroness Barbara Young uh, from uh, the uh, Woodland Trust. Shirley Kramer um, from the uh, Royal Society of Public Health. Andrew Sully, Chief Executive of Bid Food, a big part of our um, food production system. Judith Batchelor, who is, uh, I think, misattributed there. She's actually um, uh, technically at Sainsbury's, but also part of the um, Trust, Agritech. sorry, Agritech uh, board. Yeah. Uh, David Thurston, who probably has, I think maybe here, is he here somewhere in the room? Yeah, he is highly, sorry David, in all the excitement, I failed to track you down beforehand. Um, but as a representative, essentially probably one of the biggest farming uh, farmers in the entire country, it's tremendous to have you here um, from Beeswax Dyson. And then finally, uh, our, our sort of team leader here, Sue Pritchard, who I'm very thrilled is, um, is going to take us forward and keep us on track. So just to finish up, um, this is a two-year project, but we are aiming to have interim uh, recommendations and reports, and we are not just going to focus on legislative. We are going to shine a light on what people can do in all sorts of different places as soon as we can. Um, there will be uh, opportunities as we go to join in further sessions, probably in a more interactive way than we are able to do tonight. And I'm also um, particularly pleased, I've been interested in the whole topic of the rural economy uh, for some time, and I know it's something very close to His Royal Highness's heart, uh, that we've got four farmers involved in this. So this is going to be a practical commission, and one that I personally committing to uh, the time, because I think if we don't come up with practical and radical ideas for how to make this happen, uh, we will have failed. This can't just be a talking shop. We do need to see positive action at the end. But to make the point, that's not positive action just for a DEFRA legislative programme. This is a bigger, more systemic issue than that. So thank you for your time. I think we're handing back to Sue for the last word. And please do get involved. We absolutely need every one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sirene. So you will all 
want to know how you can get involved and what we will actually be doing. And that's contained in this, I think you'll agree, rather beautiful brochure that the team at the RSA have put together. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that they've, uh, they've done in putting this together, so well done, all of you. There are seven strands of work to the Commission. I'm going to quickly run through them, um, and then we're going to move straight into questions, because I'm sure many of you in the room will have questions you want to ask the panel. So the Commission will do what a Commission normally does, which is uh, take evidence through a series of meetings around the country, hearing from recognised experts and from people with real experience of the issues where they live. But we'll also be involving citizens and communities through innovative, face-to-face -face and digital engagement, which is something that the RSA is very skilled at doing. We're going to work particularly closely with three regions in England, Northwest, Southwest, and the East of England, in deep action and research projects. So any policy recommendations we make, we will know are rooted in the practical lived experience of the people who ultimately have to make them work. We will also convene separate inquiries in Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland because we are very alive to the different issues and challenges that the devolved nations are facing. We will be commissioning research from academic partners to fill the gaps in the research uh, that, that we identify. We are very fortunate to be able to draw on the RSA's 29,000 fellows around the UK and globally to extend those opportunities for public involvement and engagement. And we will, of course, share our emerging findings as we go in an iterative process so you can look at what we're producing, get involved and comment on it. In the back of the beautiful prospectus, you'll find um, ways of getting in touch with us through posts, through email, through Twitter and Instagram. So um, I think that's enough from us on the panel. I'm going to go out to questions, but perhaps before we do, I'm going to take chairs privilege and, uh, and ask the first question. I'm going to ask Caroline, if I may. So, I mean, there is, there, is, there is huge expectation and anticipation attached to this commission, which has been made possible by your very generous and substantial grant. So if you could pick out one or two things um, that you'll be proud of in two years' time, you'll be able to say, we are proud that we made that investment. What, what might they be? solve the problem obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure I, um, I, um, I think it will be um, the richness and variety of voices that are heard mm. in this um, and the collaborations that come out of it mm -hmm. and hopefully that it builds on work that and adds to mm -hmm. the work that's already been done and mm -hmm. it, it, it it makes more of it. It, mm -hmm. it turns a sort of patchwork of things into a beautiful picture and mosaic that actually tells a story, a co totally compelling story that nobody can argue with. Um, so I think that's, that's I think, yeah. what we would want to see. <coughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So let me throw it out to the floor. So we'll take, what I'm going to do is take a couple of questions and then that gives the panel um, a chance to think. So we have one question there. One question there, another question down the front. Do you, would you like to say who you are? I'm Peter Fain from the Policy Group. Um, the timing is interesting because, although I appreciate the Commission doesn't want to be totally dominated by Brexit, mm. we will be unaware of the outcome, and in particular of our relationship with Europe and with the rest of the world, for at least 18 months and probably more. And there are a whole range of possibilities. We could have a trade deal with, with Europe, but it's very unlikely at this stage, we might have no deal at all and no transition. And those outcomes, which are not really in our ability to influence at this stage, very much restrict or maybe open up new approaches that might be taken. And how does the Commission plan to deal with that? Okay, thank you, Peter. Should we take that question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, just to say hello to Helen again. I saw you last week at the conference, uh, the resurgence associated one. Um, so I've come back today with the bee in my bonnet, as you told me, um, because I've got a bee in my bonnet about industrial and medicinal hemp. 
um, and ask this question because this is something that is raising the shackles of the pharmaceutical industry and big farming in the US and other countries around the world like Australia and Canada um, and even in the Baltics in Europe which is with regards to industrial hemp isn't just good enough that we are going organic um, or sustainable or permaculture around the world but whether Brexit happens or not the prices of goods importing from India and China are rising a lot and we have an opportunity here to follow what they're doing in Colorado where they're actually saying we don't want to import goods from China anymore. We don't want to import the cotton because it's too expensive. And they're growing hemp industrial in Colorado from which they're getting the medicinal and they're actually getting the textiles. So my question here is that permaculture, mixed farming, regenerative farming is great, but when are we going to start maybe taking a look at industrial hemp, which used to be the history of the UK for 300 years, okay. and bring it back in as a centerpiece of farming to say to farmers who might be dropping out, don't drop out, you have an opportunity to get good okay. protein and actually okay, thank save you. your I career. think we've got, your, you we've got your question. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much for asking. We'll just take this one down here. Uh, Ian Sinclair. Oh. Yes. Ian Sinclair, Project Donkey Engine. Uh, I live in Finsbury Park. Now, the only cheap food available there for essentially, and I'm not making this a class issue, but working class people, or the main food there is fried chicken. And if I wanted to open another fried chicken restaurant, I'm pretty sure I could find finance. If I wanted to open a cheap, healthy food restaurant, that works for all classes, and I'm not saying anything against um, uh, hipsters and so on. I'm, I've got many friends who are hipsters. That's good because this place you know, is full of loads of hipsters. <laughs> but you know, there's nowhere for ordinary people, say a single parent, to take their kids and get you know cheap grub, okay. cheap healthy grub. And I'd like to see, and also, and what I'd also like to question is whether we can have a link between, say, horticulture and market gardening, mm -hmm. and the harvesting of produce as we used to. Mm -hmm. I'm just old enough to still to have gone down to the last of the fruit picking when the East Enders used to go on holidays. Whether we can bring some of that back. Okay, lovely. Thank you. What a variety of questions to start the evening, from Brexit through to alternative cropping to. Uh, more accessible food and food justice. Ian, do you want to have a dive um, into that lot? <clears throat> well, look, two, two observations straight off. I mean, one of which is, illustrates the sheer breadth of topics that are going to come up. I think the interesting thing is that all of those are actually valid uh, topics to raise. The, the, the challenge for the Commission is going to be working out how to fit them into a structure. But, for example, one of the key points is we will have some choices, we're not quite sure, coming on to the Brexit point, mm. of how some of the trade elements will work out. But this is a genuinely open opportunity to rethink that. So I think those things are absolutely in scope. Um, I think the substantive point on Brexit I would just like to come to because I've also had people say to me the reverse, which is it's all going to be decided like tomorrow, so why are you bothering to do this and report back in 18 months? I think the honest reality is that this will evolve and a large chunk of potentially the trade and agricultural elements uh, will be quite late to sort out because I think for most people who have having experience in Europe in the room, the agricultural trade elements are probably one of the hardest things mm. to, to negotiate. So I think what we can say is we know we won't have the CAP, that we know now actually, so there isn't uncertainty. What we don't know is we don't know the nature of the trade deal. I completely accept that that would change some of our options. But I think what we'll do is model a couple of scenarios and start to develop them. And actually, I think the two-year timing actually mm. will be very interesting because I think what we will see is some sort of interim arrangement. This potentially should arrive at a point where it could then influence the mm. final outcome. Yeah. So I'm probably a bit more optimistic on that. But we absolutely can plan now for the removal of CAP. So let's do that. John, you've got some experience of uh, chairing a commission. How would you advise us to navigate the enormous variety of 
topics that we could cover. Uh, we were given a very short time scale, mm. so it was very demanding. Um, you have more time to think through the process and to adjust your thinking as the Brexit process evolves. I think that's what Ian is right to say. Some things will be decided within that two-year period, other things won't, and uh, we're assuming there will be a transitional period. So I think, um, provided the Commission is light on its feet and willing to adapt and adjust as information comes through from the Brexit process, I think that's, that's absolutely fine. I, I mean, I think I, I would just comment on, on Ian Sinclair's uh, remark, because I think this is one of the biggest challenges we actually face in uh, Britain, is to have healthy, healthy food that is affordable. Uh, the, the, the kind of cheap, easy options are not necessarily healthy. And we have lots of families who are being fed on unhealthy food because they actually can't find either the accessibility or the affordability of, of healthy alternatives. So, you know, a, a bit of a focus on that would be, would be really good. Thank you. I'll just take a few more questions, I <coughs> think. Oh, oh yes. I just want to ask something about the Brexit point. I don't, this not unique to this, actually. This is happening across a lot of our funding. But also, I just think there's an imperative to know what good looks like, irrespective um, of what happens. So maybe it's not two years, maybe it's five years. But if we know what good is, we're prepared. And I think that's what we would want to be. Can I have another show of hands? There's one here, microphones here, over here. Well, let's start with those who've got the microphones, then. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you very much. Duncan Williamson from WWF, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to sit next to Lord Curry yesterday. Um, but I want, first of all, I completely endorse this work around going cross-department, cross-theme, because we've been calling for this at WWF for at least five years, the need for joined-up policy work making and food system thinking. Uh, but two things. One is, it's food farming and countryside. Do I take it that things like seafood and fisheries are included in this because they've not been mentioned at all? And, yeah. and on the whole, cheap food, expensive food, how are you going to approach something like the true cost of food in this? Do you want to start with that one, Helen? Uh, <laughs> what the true cost of food? Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think the true cost of th food has been one of those thorny issues that we've all been debating for the last 30 years. You know, how do we actually end up with a system which does uh, genuinely uh, reflect what the hidden costs, those inter you know, internalizes those external costs properly? Uh, and lots of great minds have been put to this, and I don't think we've found uh, many uh, easy answers. So I think it's, a, it's an important one to bring to the table. Um, and I don't think, I can't sit here and say where that will end up, but I think it's a, it's a crucially important question. Um, and, and how, when you do internalize those costs, how do you make sure that healthy food stays affordable uh, for uh, people who need it to be affordable? I mean, I think those, that nexus is, is, is pretty uh, crucial. Take another question. Neil Ransom, um, a powerful body in the food chain are clearly the, uh, the supermarkets. And I just wondered whether you uh, had considered having a commissioner from the supermarket community, and if not, how you think you might engage with the supermarkets and how receptive you think they're going to be to this initiative. Um, let me tell you that. I mean, firstly, although we've got, I suppose, arguably, although it's just not advertised as coming from Sainsbury's Youth Bachelor is at Sainsbury, so she is actually a current practitioner. Um, I'm personally, one of the reasons for me doing it is I um, previously chaired the British Retail Consortium. I know, I know the um, grocers pretty well. And uh, I would absolutely be wanting their involvement because if you think of the, the farming to sort of business to, to consumer links, uh, you couldn't really look at that system without, without them. Uh, I think they are generally interested, and I think for a lot of people, what I've been struck by when I've talked about the potential for doing this is people feel like it might be worth contributing to the debate now because previously it was, well, we can't touch the CAP, forget it. That this open door is generally important to bring more people through it, and we need, I think, the people who are playing, affecting the system, and we need the ideas and the potential disruptors who might provide change, and I think both are very welcome. Okay, so let's, so we'll get, um, oh, go on, John. 
microphone down here as well, please, and, and there. Don, did you want to could I just that? Could I just link the last two questions, because I think this is really interesting. I think it is too big an ask to assume that consumers will understand the true cost of food. I mean, the externalities that Helen mentioned, this is very complex. I was saying, as Duncan will recall, yesterday in the meeting that Andy was uh, organizing, that if, if something doesn't appear on a balance sheet or on a profit and loss account, it's really, really difficult. But it is imperative that our retailers and our key food service sector companies recognize the true cost of food. So trying to bring influence to bear there, I think, would be a big step forward. Georgina Downs, um, I'm an ag agricultural journalist and a health journalist and um, also a fellow of the RSA um, and um, I've been running a campaign for 16 years uh, called the UK Pesticides Campaign, raising and highlighting the exposure risks and adverse impacts for residents and communities living near crop sprayed fields and intensively um, uh, farmed fields. In fact, the first thing I presented to actually was the Policy Commission, um, the Curry Commission, way back in 2001. Um, basically, I, I wanted to just raise the fact and ask a question at the end. This is obviously a very, very serious issue that obviously gets ignored a lot by the government or whatever successive governments um, that are in um, at the time. Um, and in fact, there's been a, a lot of activity lately about this. A number of recent major international reports have de detailed the damage to human health um, from existing industrial and chemical intensive farming system, food and farming systems. And these include, you'll probably be aware, the United Nations report on this, of the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food um, in March that found chronic exposure to agricultural pesticides has been associated with several diseases and conditions, including cancer, developmental disorders, sterility, and that those living near crop spray fields um, are faced particular, uh, particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to exposure from these chemicals. You also had the IPES food report published last month that outlined the unacceptable harm to human health caused by our current chemical farming systems and also on the costs point, it actually okay, exposed... Yeah, it's going to be others, a question. Uh, it's to going to be a question. It exposed, uh, just on your point, it exposed some of the astronomical health costs from our current uh, farming systems. Um, so the question is, um, basically, will this commission, A, be open enough to, to not ignore the people that are directly affected, which are being ignored and shut doors on everywhere. But secondly, um, the uh, special rapporteurs for from the report from the United Nations um, actually advocated a move away from chemical farming to a non-chemical farming policy globally around the world um, to try and reduce the impacts, adverse health and environmental impacts. So will this be part of the um, Commission's remit? Thank you. So I'll just take another couple of questions in the panel. Can so the man with the microphone, you are. So Richard Perkins, also from WWF, uh, which is lucky, I suppose, two questions. So my question is about, is, are the external social and economic impacts in scope? So are you going to think about what the consequences are for the people who work on food overseas, um, for the environments that are impacted either by reductions or expansions in imports? Um, so thank you, if, if you could answer that question. And one more question then with the microphone. And then we'll... Hi, I'm Kelly Parsons. I'm a researcher at the Centre for Food Policy, City University of London. Um, the idea of a cross-government joined up approach, I think there's a lot of agreement that that would be, is needed and is a good thing. It hasn't happened yet and there's been attempts to do it in this country and other countries. So I just hope the panel could talk a bit about how they're going to tackle that and how they might um, meet that challenge that, that has you know, been proved so difficult for other projects. Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is an open process. So I think these topics will come up. I mean, the model of farming, the type of inputs, the, the trade-offs, farm incomes and, 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 and employment in rural economies. There's a sort of complex set of interactions here. And I think the whole point of this is it's food farming in the countryside. And that clearly has a human dimension and it has an environmental dimension. Mm. Um, so I don't think the, there's, there's no way these things won't be discussed. I think what I am keen to do is... Uh, it list, make sure we listen to a broad uh, church of views uh, and not, not end up with sort of just, you know, one point of view or one, one um, special angle because these, is, as we said before, are systemic issues and I, I take that on board. And, and the relation to the, the external impacts, um, I think the primary focus is, is the UK. I think when we start talking about particularly trade and other elements, then we have to think very hard about that. Are we just exporting issues in other parts? So there will be an awareness of it. But I think the main focus is 
the food farming countryside of the UK um, within that subsidiary point uh, is there. And I think to take the final point on the on joined up in government, I mean, my experience in government is that it is not very good at being joined up because it often isn't presented with a, with a clear enough ask. It's not given a please do the following. It actually, if you can give it a clear ask, it actually is not bad at, at trying to follow through. And it, it will still, there's no guarantee of perfect execution. But the challenge often in this situation has been the problem is seen as too vast, too complicated, too interdependent. And there's not much government can do with that. So we have to break it down into practical action that government could take. And it might be that we edit down, you know, from a perfect list of 20 things to the three things that government could have the most impact on. But I think if you present it as a, as a pra pragmatic ask, you can get cross-government. The problem is if you just have a generic urging people to work together, mm. frankly, everyone's too busy and hasn't got the bandwidth to do that, and, and there's not much incentive for people to do it. So I would be looking to pitch this at the very highest level through number 10 in the centre to basically make sure that this was a joined up effort, but with some really sharp asks. Mm -hmm. the, you'll see when you, um, yeah, I'm just going to lead into you, but I just wanted to make the point that you'll see when you have a chance to look at our prospectus that we are describing the changing food system, changing farming system, changing countryside system, but also the changing world. And you know, food is such an interconnected, interdependent topic. There is no way we can talk about yeah. food, farming, even countryside in the UK without you know, a deep awareness of the interdependencies and interconnections with global issues. And our responsibilities for the sustainable development goals is you know, part of what you'll find in here. Caroline, I was going to come to you because you have supported and funded uh, a whole heap of research projects which address some of the comments that uh, are being asked this evening. What's yeah, I, I, th I suppose what I wanted to say actually, I, I think the cap obviously is incredibly important, but also there is just generally this idea of externalities is now, uh, we've got a bit of wind behind this because it's not just in food. It's, it's when you look at air quality, for example, people, or in marine, uh, people, there is just an awareness of the externalities and the cost of those externalities on health, on food, on, 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 on the environment. And so I, I think it, it's a double unlocking almost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at the investment world and are now really thinking about um, these issues in terms of their investment strategies. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's not just this bit. I think we're with a tide that's going in the right direction. And, and, and also, there are all these good practices, that's these exemplar projects that we can build and grow on. It's not virgin soil. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly take um, two or three more questions before we need to break for the reception. So let's uh, take a question there, and there, and here. Thank you. Um, my name is Rosemary. I'm um, at the Science Museum, um, and as some of you probably may know, we are developing a new gallery, um, working title of Feeding Tomorrow, which is all about the challenges of sustainable food production uh, for a growing population with a changing climate. And the research that we've done has been really, really enlightening that the public know that they want to know more. There's a huge, huge knowledge gap, and they're really, really interested. They're really excited. And there's a huge mistrust there. So I suppose my question is, um, to what extent are you hoping to involve the public in your negotiations and your conversations? Are you going to be looking to engage with um, uh, local councils, schools, etc., cetera, um, to, to get more, more input there from the public who do want to know and be engaged? Yes. Right. This, this question and then this question and then thank you um, my name's claudia sturt i'm a fellow but i'm not a farmer but i am missing the arches to be here tonight um, that's probably as close as i'm getting um, it seems to me uh, as a lay person in this this area that i mean there's a there's a dizzying array of kind of interrelated issues at play here but one that we don't seem to hear very much about is the well-being resilience flourishing of farmers mm -hmm. and people who live within a rural economy um, and I just wonder whether um, we are a, we're a culture at the moment that's becoming increasingly urbanized and whether there is sufficient sort of sympathy and understanding of the fact that farming needs farmers and unless farmers can flourish, f 
farms won't flourish and food won't flourish and the environment won't flourish. And is there anything that the Commission can do to, to support farmers and their place in this kind of ecology? Thank you. I'll just take this last question. Chairman, Brian Edgley and I and my wife for the last 62 years have farmed a patch of the Chiltern Hills. Um, and now in partnership with my son and two of my grandsons, one of whom is here with me. And I welcome Lord Curry being here. I welcome the, the whole, I am a fellow of the RSA, and I do welcome this, this, this commission. It, it's enormously important. And uh, the, the booklet you prepared is a jolly good start. Very good booklet indeed. Um, now, um, on the commission in 2001, yes, I was one of the 1,200 people who responded to Sir Donald as he was then. 1,300. <laughs> 1,300, was it? Yes. And, and um, as, as Sir Donald, as Lord Curry will remember, um, we had a big discussion, the farmers in Buckinghamshire, Berkshire and Oxfordshire, um, about his report. And... Um, yeah, I can see he remembers it well. Um, one or two points I'd like to make out. Firstly, is that farm, for farmers to stay in business, they have to make a profit. Because if they don't make a profit, they have to sell up, and then they're not there anymore. So this is, and this is well illustrated in your booklet, uh, how much money has actually had to come um, from farm subsidies so far. And we're not alone on this. Most of the other countries around the world have farm subsidies, mm -hmm. apart from New Zealand, and they got away with it by devaluing their currency by 43% in the first 15 months mm -hmm. after removing the subsidies. Um, and just recently, of course, our farm prices have gone up enormously um, with, with the way the currency has moved since the Brexit vote. Now, the, the, the real point I want to make is the world is just as dangerous as it now as it was in 1914 and 1939. And on both of those occasions, um, it was the farming and, and gardeners with Dig for Victory uh, who kept the nation going because U-boats had sunk all the shipping convoys and without the... Uh, farming, which after years of depression had to get into top gear very quickly with the war ags and that kind of thing. Um, I think this RSA Commission is the one body to press on government not to let that happen again, because we live in a very dangerous world. Thank you. Thank I you. could go on, Madam Chairman, but <laughs> thanks for letting me take it. Now, in between us and the wines, I'm, go I'm going to invite all, all of the panel members to respond to those three questions and maybe any closing remarks that they might have, and then we will okay. finish for the reception. Sure. Could I just kick off, Owen? Firstly, I think engaging with the public on this is absolutely critical. Um, this is very much, again, in the spirit of the RSA, thinking about citizens, uh, consumers, and also... Uh, employees in, in various forms so uh, we will absolutely look for ways and means to do that and look to partner with organizations that will help us do it and um, connecting the two last points flourishing farmers I think are at the heart of this uh, conundrum because we <coughs> clearly can't have farming without farmers in the rural economy in, in the broader sense of the word um, and I absolutely uh, take the point that that will include you know, the, the subsidies and the payments and the, na the nature of this model is going to be mul multiple and, and complicated, but we have to have a genuine long-term future for farmers. So there is absolutely no, no doubt in my mind about it. And that relates to the final point on food security, which I think is a, is a live issue. Uh, it's one of the other issues that we will try, so we'll try and engage here, and it's the flip side of the global mm. piece is, is the balance. And, and uh, you know, I think what's... what's been brilliantly demonstrated with the width of the questioning here is is this sort of breadth the breadth and interconnectedness is is a big issue but one thing is we're going to try and sort of work out how we get get after it but i think it does also point to the fact that there's a huge amount of opportunity in this space and i think this is a fantastic opportunity for us to generally start with a much blanker sheet of paper than don was able to do uh, yes with uncertainties but with a huge uh, future in front of us, I think, if we think about this in the right way and in a very open way, and I think that's the, the thing I'd really like to stress. 
Callan, I'll come to you next. Well, I think it's essential that the public are involved, but also they are probably often more knowledgeable than we give them credit for. Um, and actually, everybody wants to feed their families and want to feed themselves with good food. And I think the assumption that people don't want to do that, I just think is, is uh, I think it's quite hubristic, actually. Um, and um, and the, one of the reasons the, it was so pleased about the RSA is because they're actually very good at doing that kind of work. So um, farmers, absolutely, I think I said in my speech, absolutely critical, or we think they are to this. Um, and I would agree that the sheer scope of this is um, extraordinary and very complex. But I would say that one of the things that Esme is quite good at being a funder about, around these sorts of issues is that we know it, it all gets, can get quite messy and mm -hmm. difficult and that things won't always go quite according to plan or they might go in slightly different directions. And that's just the reality of trying to solve these really, or trying to move the dial on these really tricky issues. And actually we're happy to go along on that journey with you and learn as we go. Don, I'll come to you next. Um, thank you, Sue. Um, Helen mentioned that um, our Curry Report, uh, so-called, um, had reconnection as its theme. And um, those of you who were involved at the time will recall that we, we saw this as a reconnection uh, from both sides. So there's a reconnecting farmers with, its, with their markets and having a better understanding of what the consumers required but also connecting consumers and the public with farming. So it's a two-way process. So the question about uh, the public and the knowledge gap is still a relevant question because I think uh, 15 years on, I think there is actually greater empathy uh, with farming by the public at large. So efforts that people have gone to to try and explain what we do, the influence of country fire, all those things I think have led to a greater empathy with farming. But have we cracked the problem? No, we haven't. Uh, there's still a massive challenge, and we have to assume, um, <clears throat> I said this yesterday, uh, that as a consequence of Brexit, we may well be exposed to greater global competition. I think we need to assume that markets might be opened up and we might face greater competition. So the need to, to have a public who better understand the countryside and what it's about and why it's important and why the food that we produce from our countryside is food they should buy in preference to other food is going to be an interesting challenge, I think, and an important one. So that connection is going to be even more important going forward than it is now. And as for the well-being of farmers, I mean, I'm deeply concerned about this. Many of you know I chair the Prince's Countryside Fund and His Royal Highness is deeply concerned about the future of family farms, small and medium-sized family farms, and we're spending a lot of time in the Prince's Countryside Fund uh, with our Farm Resilience Program offering a helping hand to family farms uh, in enable them to respond to the challenges and economic pressures that we're facing today. Uh, and I think we're going to have to do more of that. David Fersden will be well equipped to reflect that in the commission because he produced a report himself on succession and this, the structural issues that we face in agriculture today. So these are big challenges and the commission needs, definitely need to look at this and, and, uh, and try and track a way through this using whatever resources there are available. The last thing we do we need is more and more bodies. We've got existing bodies who've got the capability to help and we need to find a way of bringing that together more effectively going forward. Thank you. Helen. Well, I, I'm just delighted that we've got two years to do this actually um, because uh, as Donna said you know the Curry Commission was a very short sharp process uh, where we met very intensely for a period of time um, this is a, uh, a, a bigger process because of the time that we're in and because of the moving parts around us as has been described this evening already and I think Caroline's right to say that this might get a bit messy Actually, there's a lot of listening to do. There's a lot to hear. There's a lot to bring in. And I think that I'm pleased that we've got enough time to be able to make sure we hear before we start to get too concerned about absolutely what the, you know, what, 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 the, what the report needs to, to say. 
The other thing I feel really encouraged about, we've talked a lot about the problems here today, but there's some really good stuff going on. Mm. Attitudes are changing really quickly all over the place. Um, so I think that we can build on an awful lot of good work, a lot of good thinking that's happened already by many different organizations, brilliant thinking going on. So it's not like you're starting from scratch in a whole load of areas. And it's not like you're working uh, with farmers or businesses who don't want to change because there's a real appetite for change. We're seeing it all the time. Um, so I feel really encouraged that there are, uh, there is stuff, there's a wind that we can run with at a time when, uh, as Caroline said, you know, things are unfrozen in that way. I think we will need to be really clear about trying to define what, what is it we're trying to do here? What is that? What are the outcomes? And be really creative about what mechanisms we can use. They're not just all about subsidies. They're, there's a lot we can do from a whole bunch of different uh, quarters. So anyway, um, it's going to be complicated. It's going to be difficult. Uh, but uh, we're here. We've got a great team. We've got some great leadership. We've got the RSA. Um, and I just, again, want to thank everybody uh, who has brought us to this point, um, particularly the steering group, particularly ESME, and particularly all of those people who've contributed to this um, along the way. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lovely note on which to finish. So if you haven't uh, done so already, please do pick up a copy of our prospectus, which is outside the auditorium. Um, there are drinks. There's a drink reception downstairs. Please stay and continue the discussion. You may spot amongst your number, some of our commissioners moving amongst you in a mysterious way. Uh, if you want to stop them and chat, please do. And finally, uh, please join me in thanking our terrific speakers, leaders in their field. Helen Browning, Caroline Mason, Don Curry, Lord Curry, and Sri and Cheshire. Thank you very much. <laughs>